Okay, we're going to get started now. I first of all want to thank you very much for coming. I'm the founder and CEO of Accepted. My name is Linda Abraham, and uh, we love helping people with low stats do what it takes to get accepted to top MBA programs. Now, a few items before we get started here. Um, I Again, I'm going to remind you, I'm going to refer to it several times. Please take a second to download, and my suggestion is that you actually print out the worksheet that we've prepared for you. Carly, can you post that link again for people who just came? And uh, maybe post it periodically, certainly at the beginning, as people come in and get settled. Um, I think it's going to help you get the most out of today's uh, masterclass. I may ask questions in the course of the presentation, and um, I could ask you to raise your hands in response to a question or post an answer. If I ask you to post an open-ended answer, please do so in the chat window. Um, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands now so we can test your Zoom skills, and that just means clicking on the hand icon. Um, raise your hand if you are here because you want to earn an MBA to enhance your career and achieve lifetime professional goals. Again, raise your hand if you want to enhance your career and achieve lifetime professional goals. Okay, great. Most of you are here for the right reasons. That's very good. And you know how to use Zoom. Great. Um, we're going to have a contest, a fun contest towards the end based entirely on the presentation of today's presentation. So pay attention and you can win a free consultation with me. It's about the only way to consult with me individually at this point in time. Um, generally, our consultants who are highly experienced uh, seasoned professionals in the MBA admissions do handle working one-on-one -on -one with clients. And uh, we've also planned a Q&A at the end of the webinar. So you can post your, post your questions at any point in time, either during the presentation or at the end. Please do so in the question window. It makes it much easier for me to go through the questions if they post them in the question window, and we'll just cover more ground. You can use the chat and window again to answer my open-ended questions. And now I have a favor. Please, please fill out the survey you're going to receive when you leave. As I indicated a minute ago, or as you indicated a minute ago, the point of this whole process, the whole application process, is about taking you on a path to a much greater goal. It's not just about getting in or even getting the MBA. It's about the whole process, the application process, the MBA is a means to an end. And that end is your professional goal. A couple of get to know you questions before we launch into the main part of the, con of the content and the, and the masterclass. Um, Carly, can you post that first poll? Okay, great, here we go. Where are you at in the application process? Are you planning to apply as a reapplicant in 2021-22? In other words, the next cycle. Are you planning to apply for the first time in 2021-22? Are you planning to reapply in a later cycle? Are you planning to apply for the first time in a later cycle? Those are the options. Again, are you planning to apply as a reapplicant in the next application cycle, 2021-22, or first time applicant in 21-22, as a reapplicant in a later application cycle, or for the first time in a later application cycle? We're at 66% having voted. Can we get it up a little higher? Five, four, three, two, one, with 79% having voted. Great, thank you. We have 26% are planning to apply as a reapplicant in 2021. 48% are planning to apply for the first time in 2021-22. 4% are planning to apply, reapply in a later cycle. And 22% are planning to apply for the first time in a later cycle. So we have about 26%, a fourth, a little more than a fourth, who are planning ahead for a later cycle. Okay, great, you're all welcome. Very, very much welcome. And then the second question we have for you is, what are you concerned is low? Your GPA, your test score, both, or something else? Again, what are you concerned is low? GPA, test score, both, or something else, not related to academics. Okay, we're at 89% having voted. Fantastic. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's close the poll. And 89% having voted. 54% of you are concerned about your GPA, so that's slightly more than half. 31% about your test score. 15% about both. So we have here 
almost 70% concerned with their GPA. Um, okay, and those are very interesting results. Like the test score is used to be a much bigger factor, but I guess with test waivers, it's becoming a less important one. Okay, that makes sense. Just making a note here. Okay, a few years ago, a few years ago, I interviewed for Admission Straight Talk, except this podcast, Dr. Scott Schaefer, who's co-author of the enjoyable book, Roadside MBA, Backroad Lessons for Entrepreneurs, Executives, and Small Business Owners. He's also a columnist for Inc. Magazine. In the book, he and two other economics professors who all started their professorial careers at Kellogg decide to explore the world of small business and see how Main Street relates to economics. The book is a collection of case studies from Main Street, and the three professors use these case studies to elucidate basic economic theory. In the process, they, or at least one of them, Dr. Mike Mazio, developed Mazio's Law. The right answer to every strategic question is, it depends. Mazio's Law could easily be applied to MBA admissions because in looking at your GPA, your test score, and sometimes your amount of work experience and attempting to analyze them, my response frequently is, it depends. The context for those numbers really counts a lot. And much like the professors who traveled thousands of miles and kilometers from Alabama to Idaho and lots of places in between, I have discovered that the answer to many of the questions I'm asked is, it depends. So let's explore some of the factors that determine what actually are low stats and what to do about them. Let's also, I just want to tell you what you can expect in the course of this masterclass. The focus is going to be on your test score and GPA. Now, I realize that GPA right now is a larger factor than the test score, but the test score is still a factor and don't underestimate it. If the most people are still applying with the GMAT, if their a test score is required, I think the numbers applying with a GRE are between a quarter and a third, depending upon the school. And more and more schools are including GRE stats as part of their class profile. But if your target programs don't, you don't include those stats in their class program, use a GRE comparison tool. Hang on, let me get rid of this so you can see it. From ETS for approximations. Oh, sorry about that. For approximations and comparisons, if you're applying with the GRE. By the end of the hour, we're going to answer two key questions. This is the goal for the masterclass. What defines low? And what to do if you have low stats, which I assume is what most of you are here for, but I think the first question is the one that you really have to answer first. Now, why are these numbers important? Can you give me your thoughts on that in the chat window? Again, why are these stats important? Why are these stats important? In the chat window, please. Go into schools ranking, very good, Gillen. Admissions officers use it to gauge success in their programs or to anticipate your success in that program, right, Liz? Rankings, that's right, okay, you all got that one. Serves as an indicator to a future academic performance, also rankings, good, Bharat. Um, to assess students' academic potential, excellent methods. You hit the nail on the head determines ability to handle grad school curriculum, right? All right, most of you are, are getting the main reason. That's right. Schools want to admit people who can do the work and thrive. Now, why do you need both of them? Test scores show you have the raw intellectual ability, okay? Um, you have the head, if you will, and both the GMAT and the GRE have been shown to correlate well to success in the first year of an MBA program. So if the GMAT shows you have the, the head, the grades show that you have the back end, and sometimes also the front end depends on the course in the school, but it shows that you have the discipline to sit and study, to do the work, to get it done on time, et cetera. None of the top MBA programs want people who are going to struggle, and they certainly don't want to admit people who are going to flunk out. And this is just one quote from Chicago Booth that lays it out very explicitly. We look for applicants who have both the ability and desire to thrive within a challenging and stimulating environment. They want to know you can do the work. And really the foundation of a good application is showing the schools you can do the work. 
It's a necessary but insufficient condition for acceptance. Now, I'm going to again ask you in the chat window to post, what are some of the factors that need to be considered in determining whether you have a low score or not? Average for the school. Very good. Brought difficulty of the program. <clears throat> I mean, the, your undergraduate program, Amala, right? The difficulty, yes. Okay, difficulty of the program that you attended, 100% right. It's very important. Any other factors? Scores from people coming from your undergraduate program and or your career field. Good, Liz. Good. Got a great audience today. Anybody else? All right, then I'm going to continue. You've all hit on, on some elements that are important. Schools posted scores are the components of your application. Very good, Gillen. Other post components of your application are really important. Um, okay, that's right. In a nutshell, on a really, really high level, low depends on the target schools you're applying to and you, the context, right? Um, as Gillen said, other components of your application, not just your GPA and your undergrad program, but kind of, and we'll go through some of those other components in a second. For, for example, just in terms of, of the importance of the school you're aiming at, a 680 GMAT score is a low GMAT for Stanford, Wharton, and Harvard Business School, which all have GMATs around 730, maybe a little lower, maybe a little higher, but all around there. That sample 680 is above average for Michigan State, which has a GMAT around 674 average GMAT, Penn State 657, Purdue 631, and the University of Arizona 659. And they all rank in the top 10 for various US news specialty rankings. So if your test score isn't that high and you're particularly interested in an in a area of business where these schools are strong, you may not, they might be great for you and they just may not have, and, and you might be a very attractive applicant to them but it might not be for Harvard or MIT or, or some of the, the top ranked programs overall. And the same with a GPA. A 3.3 is low for Harvard, Stanford, and Wharton. It's low in the top 10. It's probably low in the top 15. It is competitive for most programs outside the top 20. Now let's provide a very flexible, elastic definition of low for GMAT and GPA, all right? General rule is that if your GPA is 0.3 below average, you're, you know, you have a low GPA, but there are a lot of mitigating or exacerbating factors. Okay. So you, um, that's again, it's a rule of thumb. There you go. There's my 0.3. Uh, rule of thumb for your GPA is 0.3 below, but it's a fuzzy 0.3. So what are some of the mitigating factors? The school you attended as an in as, uh, undergrad, what was, is it known for rigor? Is it known for a tough grading scale? For example, the IITs in India are very much known for a tough grading scale. The military academies in the United States are known for almost no grade inflation. Many engineering programs are known for little or no grade inflation. You see Berkeley among them. Are you from an underrepresented group? that may not, uh, that, that does, you know, that the schools are trying to attract, whether that's underrepresented ethnically, uh, geographically in terms of nationality, or perhaps under, underrepresented professionally. What about the difficulty of the coursework that you took? Were you challenging yourself as an undergrad or were you just kind of coasting along, taking the courses that you had to and doing the minimum amount of work? And was there an upward trend to your GPA? That will definitely help you. And what about the number of years since graduation and, and maybe the low grades that you had? If you had some low grades as a freshman, but you had a steady upward trend, and now you've been working for five years, and again, you see a lot of growth professionally and handling demanding assignments, well, again, that's all going to mitigate the impact of that one bad year. And of course, the test score. If you have a low GPA and you take the test, test score and you get a great score in it, that is helping you. Um, circumstances beyond your control that might've contributed to the low GPA. If you had a bad semester because you were, I hope this isn't true, in a, an accident and were hospitalized for a certain period of time, or you um, were dealing with illness, or perhaps there was a family crisis, 
at a particular point in time. And other than that particular point in time, your grades were really high. Well, that's context that the schools need to know. And it's going to reduce the impact of that bad semester or year, especially if your grades rebounded after this difficult period passed. Or maybe you supported yourself and your family. That means you were working and you didn't have the same amount of time that the, that the student who was devoting themselves almost full time to being a student had. That's context that the school needs to know about. What would make your low GPA look worse? Well, if you're from an overrepresented group and the schools have lots of people to pick from with to similar profiles, why should they take a chance on you and your ability to perform? They'll take the person similar to you with a higher GPA in a competitive process. Or perhaps you come across as somebody who kind of checked the boxes and took the minimum in terms of demanding coursework. Maybe you come from a program that's known for very high grade inflation, in which case your low GPA is gonna look a little bit worse. If there was a downward trend to your GPA, that's gonna make it look worse. If you combine a below average GPA with a low test score and you're applying to programs that uh, require you to take the test, it's not gonna help, it's gonna look worse because the test and the GPA basically confirm the, the concern, strengthen the concern that you're not gonna be able to do the work. If your job shows a lack of progress or challenge, again, it's going to confirm the idea that you just are not quite up to snuff. Now, with a GMAT or GRE, the, again, there's a rule of thumb, and that is 30 points below the school's average. And frankly, it's just as elastic and flexible as the 0.3 guideline for the GPA. So what are some mitigating factors um, that would impact the, the way a school views a low test score? Extenuating circumstances at the test, test uh, time or the test site. That could be external stress from noise, construction, uh, an earthquake. I am in Los Angeles, so we're, we're always aware of the possibility of earthquakes. You could have been sick the day of the exam. Uh, you might be dealing with some, some difficulties in your family at that point in time. And they could all uh, be context for the, the um, low test score. However, with that being said, the truth is, is that these reasons come across somewhat as shallow excuses because you can almost always retake the exam. It might postpone your application to a different round or even a different cycle, but you can retake. And if lightning strikes twice in a testing situation, the excuses just don't work. They become excuses as opposed to valuable context. Now, in terms of your reaction to either the low test score or a low GPA, What's a key difference between the two of them? In the chat window, please. What's a key difference between dealing with low test score and a low GPA? Right, Amala, you can't change a low GPA or retake a low GPA. Time, Bharat, I assume that's, that's what you're intending. That's basically it. You can change a low GPA by retaking. Exactly, Liz. That's the big, big, big difference. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fine. No problem. <laughs> you can't go back and change your GPA. You have your transcript, right? So what do you, you can do something, however, about it. Your overriding aim in applying is to show that you can excel in a graduate management program. And that either circumstances that can, and that the, either the circumstances that contributed to your low GPA no longer exist, or that those circumstances still exist, but you know now, you now know how to deal with them. You can can excel now. So how can you show that? How can you make that case? Take additional classes and earn A's in them. You can take retake business related classes or quant classes if your grades were poor. You can perhaps try and get a certificate if it's relevant to your career goals, like the CFA or the CPA. Or there's uh, there, you know, risk management, something like that, because those activities will show that you now know how to sit and study. You can also aim for a high GMAT score. Again, it correlates well with performance in business school. In the additional information section, you can provide context for your low grades. Um, it usually is best in the additional information section. Sometimes, again, it depends on the, the specific circumstances, but um, 
you want to provide that context, whether it's other responsibilities, illness, you started out in the wrong major and your grade took a hit then. Um, be aware that if you say you were too involved on campus and you state that proudly, like I'd do it all over again, it means that admissions committees will read that as you had poor time management skills or you're prioritizing other activities over your study, studies more than extenuating circumstances. That means you made choices. And if you're proud of those choices, then that you're likely to make the same choices again, it's not gonna, it's not gonna go over so well, all right? Now we have a post on dealing with a low GPA. It's a very informative post. It's on your screen right now, the link. And we'll also be sending out those links to you later. So watch out for that email so that you can, you can um, uh, take a look at that article, that post, because again, 70% of you express concern about your GPA. What if you're concerned about your low test score? You're the schools that you really want to go to require the, um, the GMAT or the GRE. Some are requiring the EA, also offer the EA. Some take other tests. The best way to handle a low test score is to improve it, to retake, to re-prepare and raise the score. That is the best way to handle it. Now, if you're not sure whether to retake, please see this blog post and you may even wanna watch the webinar I gave on the topic. What if you can't retake or you try to retake and you haven't been able to raise the score? Do you have any suggestions what you can do then? In the chat window, please, this is for you. What can you do then? Compensate for low score with letters of rec, work experience, showing quant skills. Good. Very good. Good, Dylan. Anybody else? Try explaining your low score as well. Again, it's, it's, it's providing context for the low score. Examples of leadership. Well, leadership is a quality they're going to want to see, but it doesn't really address concerns about your academic ability. Try to take a different test. Good, Mitt. Very good. If you tried, took the GMAT, try the GRE. If you took the GRE, try the GMAT. If they take the EA, try the, the EA. Very good suggestion. Compensate with concept applications of professional life. I'm not sure I understand what you mean there. Odd uh, aid. I'm not sure, if I mispronounce somebody's name, please accept my apologies. Okay, let's go, go on. If you can't retake or haven't been able to raise your score, high grades in business classes and demanding work experience do mitigate somewhat. If your quant score is the concern, is the issue, do you have other evidence of quantability? You may want to create some evidence of that quantability. You can consider taking uh, something like MBA Math, which is at mbamath.com. No, it is not an affiliate. Um, it is a, a course developed by, I think, a Dartmouth professor, Dartmouth Tuck professor, specifically to prepare MBAs for the quantitative demands of a top MBA program. And taking that will, and doing well in it, will show the schools that you are improving your quant skills, even if your GMAT or GRE doesn't show it. There are also classes that you can take like statistics for business, accounting, calculus, uh, at a local community college, MOOCs, HBS online core, it's also highly credible and does a good job of preparing you. Now, Toronto Rotman will waive the GMAT entirely for anybody who passes the three levels of the CFA. You can also ask, and somebody suggested this, recommenders to provide evidence of your quantability. And they don't have to say, because he got a quant score, low quant score, I want to mention, blah, blah, blah. They can just say, you know, uh, Johnny handled this amazing uh, analysis that I asked him to do and give a few details and go on from there. I knew I could trust him for quant, on quant, uh, quantitative analysis. If your verbal score is the issue, you might want to take classes in communications and English for business. Consider joining Toastmasters and where you can work on your verbal and presentation skills. Ask your recommenders, again, to comment positively on your communications ability. You know, Jane, I knew I could rely on Jane for her clear writing and excellent negotiation skills, whatever it is, and give an example. Point of these efforts, the point of these efforts is to show that you have improved in an area of weakness and that the score doesn't actually accurately reflect today your abilities because you've improved them. At the same time, well, that's, that's what you should do if 
you cannot raise your score, I still think it's a tough, tough sell. You can, today, you can also consider applying exclusively to programs that are test optional. Realize that if a school is test optional and your grades are low, you will still need to provide some evidence of your ability to succeed academically. If your grades are competitive and the schools you are interested in are test optional or allow you to apply for a test waiver, go for it. <laughs> Don't torture yourself. Just go for it. Okay. Now, the other thing I want you to keep in mind, I, we've occasionally seen applicants who are so focused on their weakness that they forget to do something that all applicants really have to do. And that is you have to present an application that in totality shows you with desirable strengths, leadership, initiative, ability to contribute to the class and school community. I attended the AGAC conference last year and one of the exercises we did there was where several consultants and several admissions directors got together and evaluated uh, um, some uh, stereotypical applications, okay? And the admissions committee members kept saying, you know, I really miss knowing the, the admissions directors. I really miss knowing the other people already accepted to the class. This idea that they are creating a class and a learning environment is really, really important. So you have to make a positive case for acceptance and show that you're going to contribute something special to the class. I think somebody actually mentioned that earlier, but I wasn't quite sure what they meant at that point. So the attributes that I just mentioned, leadership, initiative, et cetera, can compensate somewhat for below average stat stats. And they can compensate a lot, not even compensate. They can, they can make you a more attractive candidate once the schools have confidence that you can do the work academically because of the steps that you took to mitigate the impact of your low stats. So even if you do present higher grades and additional coursework and a good test score and circumstances and show that circumstances that affected your performance previously no longer affect your performance, you still need to show that you're going to be an asset to your team, class, and community. This was particularly well brought out. Um, in a podcast interview I had with the head of admissions at Rotman, where he talked about Rotman's focus on a spike factor. And Carly, if you can find that podcast and perhaps uh, post it, that would be great. Um, uh, it was, he, he really highlighted this idea of contributing to class. That is the spike factor at Rotman. It's something that they emphasize, but it's something that all top schools look for. Like all other candidates, you must not just present facts that convince the admissions committee to overlook a weakness, but you must create a compelling case for acceptance and the idea that you are going to really add to your class, the school's community, and ultimately the school's reputation. So as I said at the very beginning, your ability to do the work is necessary, but an insufficient condition for acceptance. You also need to show fit and provide positive reasons for acceptance. And this was best expressed years ago by Dr. Andrew Ainsley when he was Senior Associate Dean of the MBA program and Associate Professor of Marketing at UCLA Anderson. Uh, he later became the University, University of Rochester's Simon Business School Dean. On that accepted chat long ago, he said, if I'm missing this or that, is that a problem? I think the bigger thing for applicants is to realize that what we are looking for are signs of something exceptional. It's not as though we are hunting for the negatives. We are really hunting for the positives. So I'd hate to categorize it and say that we are looking for this or we're looking for that. If we have some sign of exceptional leadership, some sign of exceptional intelligence, some sign of exceptional business experience, just some sign that you shine in the pack, that is what we're looking for. Okay, so keep that in mind. Now, there are circumstances when the numbers are probably just too low to mitigate or to be confident that you can mitigate, especially for the most competitive programs. That is particularly true when applications are up, like they are now, um, or when both your GPA and test scores are significantly below average and you can't get them where you want them to be. Um, Maybe you don't qualify for the te that test waiver. And you can't take the steps I've outlined above, or be before I should say, because of time restrictions or other responsibilities or simply lack of desire. I'd then suggest that you apply to one or two dream schools, but most of your applications, and by most, I mean maybe three or four or even six others, depending upon where you're applying, should go to programs where you're competitive and that support your goals. 
Okay. Again, the key here, I say this over and over again, is you want to apply to programs that support your goals and where you are competitive. So for help in choosing schools, I'd strongly recommend this free download, Best MBA Programs, the guide to select and get the best, the, the right one. And again, the URL is on the screen. We will also be sending it out to you in an email. So watch out for that email. And the other thing you can do is seek guidance from MBA experts. Our, our staff, we have former admissions directors, highly experienced consultants who are here and more than happy to guide you in terms of where you should be applying given your goals and qualifications and how to mitigate the impact of that low GPA and uh, or test score or whatever it is, um, whether it's too little work experience, too much work experience, we've definitely you know, been dealing with it for years, actually decades at this point. I hope you now see why it depends. And that's one of the reasons that individual guidance can be so helpful. It's so often the answer to questions about low stats. Now let's review a few of the factors it depends on. And we're gonna review it with a contest, okay? So in the chat window, please, the first one to answer the next question, I'm gonna have three questions. And the first one to answer it right will win that free consultation with me, okay? The first question is, what are two overarching categories to consider when determining if your stats are low? Gillen, you got it. <laughs> you got it. That's right. That your target schools and the rest of your application. Where are you applying to? And what are the other factors in your profile? That's what it depends on. Okay, so that was the first question. Um, Gillen, you'll be contacted via email. If you, all the winners actually, you'll be contacted via email after the um, uh, masterclass. And if you're not, please reach out to support at accepted.com. Okay. Yeah, Arnold, you also got it. Next question. What are two things that you can do to mitigate a low GPA? Chat window, please. What are two things you can do to mitigate a low GPA? Okay, Liz, you got that. Get a certification, C CPA, CFA, and a high test score will also high GMAT will mitigate the impact of a low GPA, absolutely. And then the last question, and again, the first one to, to get this one, none. previous winners, please don't, don't, share, don't do it, okay? Um, what is the best way to handle a low GMAT or GRE, low test score? Okay, Tulika, you got it. Tulika, right, retake, retake, right, okay. Yeah, another option is to take a different test, but yes. Okay, thank you, Carly, great. At this point in the masterclass, what is the most valuable insight or helpful piece of information you received during today's presentation? In the chat window, please. Okay, focus on the positive. This is from Arnold, as those are the of most significant. I wouldn't say that they're of more significance. I'm just saying that don't ignore them. You, you have to make that case while at the same time mitigating the impact of the low stats. Okay, every weakness can be addressed. No single thing will take you out of the race. Okay, good, that's wonderful. Everyone is different and the applications are unique to each person, so there's no one fits all rule. Excellent. Oh, music to my each, Sudar Deep. That you need to show some type of uniqueness, some type of exceptional leadership, intelligence, or experience because they're looking for the positives. Oh, good, Liz. Great audience. Talika, scores from your competitive pool decide your relative chance. They influence your relative chance. I'm not sure they decide it. Okay, a little bit strong there, but if you don't mind my um, slight correction, okay, to your takeaway. Anybody else want to share a takeaway from today? Should also be using application to show uniqueness to class community reputation. Also, point three or three points on test as a general range or low score is good, Gillen. Thank you. Thank you. This is great. Okay. 
So yes, many times the answer to how can I get accepted to MBA programs with low stats is, it depends. I've gone through mitigating and exacerbating factors. But at the end of the day, the fact remains that you may not have the experience to assess and weigh the mitigating and exacerbating factors. You could overestimate your qualifications and end up with a fistful of rejections. Or you could underestimate your qualifications and reject yourself from programs that may have been happy to consider and even admit you. Even if you're applying appropriately, you may lack count confidence in your ability or the know-how to make that strong, compelling case for acceptance so that you not only persuade the schools to overlook a blemish, but convince them that you will be an asset to your community, school, and alumni network. These are the issues we address constantly with our clients as we help them overcome that low test score or GPA, and sometimes both a low test score and GPA. We've guided applicants with low scores and GPAs to programs where they can get accepted and thrive. We've also helped applicants with below average stats get accepted to programs where the average test score is 50 or more points below, sorry, above their score. Their score is below. And we've done the same thing with applicants who had below average GPAs. Look, applying to top MBA programs is not easy, especially if you're dealing with a low stat. And the application process is not a one-time event. It's a process, a process that lasts for months. And many times you're going to find yourself scratching your head and wondering what to do, what on earth, how can I deal with this? Can you imagine yourself in that situation? You can turn to friends and family who will kindly do their best to help you but who may not know more than you do, and they may know less than you do, or perhaps they base their advice on their own individual experience five, 10, or more years ago. Instead, imagine yourself having a question and having someone to turn to who is knowledgeable, experienced, and devoted to helping you succeed. That's your accepted consultant. And then imagine yourself sharing news of your acceptance with your friends, family, and colleagues, and of course, with your consultant who has become a friend. With your professional future at stake and with the additional burden of a low stat or two, you should not rely on amateurs. Turn to accept as professionals with years of experience in the field because they can guide you, answer your questions, provide needed constructive criticism, and help you put your best foot forward. In addition to improving your chances of acceptance, having an accepted mentor at your side can save you time and reduce your stress. Here's, you get, here's what you get at accepted access to expertise and experience in the MBA admissions process, and specifically in dealing with negatives. You have options in terms of services. You can purchase one hour for $340, which is less than the typical application fees to two schools. Um, or you can purchase a comprehensive package, which is more than significantly more than $340, but it's there for you. You get a personal mentor dedicated to helping you as an individual and dealing with all those it depends factors and you can save time. Candor, a mentor, and objectivity combined with decades of experience in MBA admissions, that's exactly what you need to enhance your chances of acceptance to the best programs for you. Now, some may say, isn't accepted expensive? Definitely not a cheap service because of the quality of our staff. However, you face expensive risks associated with not using accepted. Reapplication can cost easily a couple of thousand dollars, especially if you have to retake the test and you decide to get a tutor to help you with it. One additional year of pre-MBA earnings can cost you in the five figures in dollars. And there's a potential that you could have gotten into a better program with higher lifelong earnings and network, and that could cost you big time. Now, enough, enough from me. What do our clients say? Here's just a, a couple of comments. I really appreciate the wishes. We'd sent congratulations on prior acceptance to Duke and Duke Fuqua. Here's the cherry on the Sunday. I just got a call from MIT Sloan. I was accepted. MIT is definitely my first choice. Frankly, it was my moonshot application. I never would have thought that it would actually work out. Now, this client had a low test score and a competitive GPA and was applying when there were no test waivers to, to MIT. Or this one. Esmeralda was very supportive and helpful. She knew what I was good at and helped me to present that positive part in my essays. I'm more confident. I'm a more confident MBA applicant because of her dedication and assistance. I came to accept it as Meralda with no idea what was ahead of me, but I've received an outstanding quality of, quality of services that I could never have imagined. Here's a couple more, or one more, just to jog your mind. You've helped me apply to seven schools in the USA, including Haas, Kellogg, and Fuqua. I was invited to interview with every school that I applied to, despite my low GMAT of only 660. 
Now the results have started coming out, and so far I have been admitted, admitted to talk in Fuqua. There's no way I would have been successful without your invaluable edits and mock interviews. I owe the success to you, Jennifer. Jennifer Bloom. And then the last one, I wanted to update you on my business school plans. I was just accepted to Northwestern off the wait list, and I will be going to Kellogg in the fall. I am so excited about Kellogg, and I'm so thrilled to have this opportunity. I wanted you to know that there is no way I have a, could have accomplished this without Natalie's help. Now, she had a GMAT in the mid 600s when she applied, and she was a very non-traditional stu student uh, in terms of her work experience with few quant classes. So all you've heard from clients who work with different consultants, we're applying to different schools, different challenges, same result, acceptance at top MBA programs. Now, I, I can't promise that everybody gets in because it's not true. Um, in 2018-19, however, 86% of our MBA clients who replied to our survey were accepted to at least one of the business schools that they applied to. And I'd like you to now picture yourself a year from now, perhaps after attending an admit weekend for one of your dream schools. You sought and implemented the advice of an accepted consultant, and you are now on the threshold of an exciting MBA experience and an even more exciting career and future. Grab hold of that dream. Do as the clients you just heard from did. They followed these steps. Visit accepted.com slash MBA advice. Choose the service that's right for you. And you can start with as little as a one hour purchase of advice, or you can purchase a multi-hour plan from this page to lower your hourly cost and use as you proceed through the application process. Packages are on a different page, but they're also accessible from this page. Get the guidance you need and apply confidently and effectively. Now you can get answers to your burning questions and insights on how to deal with your low stats, given your specific circumstances, context, and the intersection of your profile, you and your target schools, your strengths, and yes, your weakness, weaknesses. Now let's move on to, um, you're very welcome, Gellin. I just saw his, his post or her post. And now let's move on to your questions. I see you've, you've posted quote, several and you're welcome to post more, okay? Okay, so anonymous attendee asked if a school has waived the GR GMAT requirement and you have a low GPA, is it still worth applying if you didn't write the GMAT or GRE? What else qualifies as proof of quant skills? I think I did address this somewhat in, in the course of the um, webinar. So if, if this has already been answered, maybe just indicate it. But you can take courses and get good grades in them, whether it's at your local community college, online, something like HBS Core, MBAMath.com. Um, MOOCs, massive open online courses through Coursera, et cetera. Um, those are some of the things you can do. You can ask uh, your recommenders to comment positively on your quantitative abilities. Um, there are a whole list of things that I, I, you know, I said before. Um, okay. Let's see what else we have here. Suardeep asks, I work in oil and gas and a newly formed strategy team. Never had a strategy team in the company. And progression at my company has been non-existent. How can I deal with this? You know, I need to know a little bit more, I think, to, to really answer. Plus with oil and gas, it's been very difficult with redundancies and pay cuts frequently. I would need to know more about what you have done as opposed to what hasn't happened to be able to say how you deal with this. Realize that increases in responsibility, even if they're not accompanied by increases in, uh, in title or different or promotions, formal promotions, do show, allow you to show growth. Okay, so if you have been working, say, managing increasingly uh, valuable equipment or working on deals that are larger and larger in size, that is one way to show progression on the job. So that would be about the only, you know, just based on the information I have. That would be about the only thing I could suggest. Uh, I don't have a lot of, um, yeah, I don't have enough information to give more suggestions. Liz asks, so if overcommitment is part of the reason for a low GPA, can you mention it and show that you've enhanced your time management skills, especially if your GPA is showing an upward trend or is it generally better to avoid mentioning this? No, I think it's, it would, if, if you 
what I was trying to say earlier was that if you say, I was, I was really, really involved on campus, I'm proud of what I contributed, I do it all again, then you're not taking responsibility for poor time management. If you say, I was over-involved in my freshman year or sophomore year, I realized I was making a mistake and it was, it was taking away from my studies and my learning. And I decided that I was going to change. I improved my time management skills such that I brought my GPA up and I still maintained my involvement in my most important commitments. That's actually really good. It provides context for the low GPA. You show growth, you take responsibility, you show maturation, improvement, and you also show that you kept your commitment or you, you followed up on your commitment, your most important commitment. You learned how to prioritize. You learned how to ma manage your time. So um, anyway, Liz, I hope I answered that question for you. It was a good question. Great question. All right, Bara, you're very welcome, Liz. Bara asks, what would be considered a big difference between the verbal and quant scores? In other words, would a 167 verbal and a 156 on the GRE raise eyebrows? <clears throat> I am assuming that a 323 total in and of itself isn't half bad for all but the top 20 schools. That's a big difference. I, I can't give you off the top of my head. I would say, a, a, you know, the problem isn't the difference, by the way. The problem is the low score on the quant. 167 is fantastic. The problem is a low quant score. Um, if you had a 167 and, you know, 169 and a 164, nobody would look at it twice. I would say differences of more than five points, especially if the low score is below a school's, your target school's average for GREs on that score is an issue. Again, the context counts. The schools you're applying to counts. Um, that's really the issue. In addition, unless you have evidence of quantability, perhaps from your undergraduate, uh, uh, your, your undergraduate record, I'd be concerned about your quant skills. So with a 156. So you might either want to consider Again, I don't, I don't know that enough really um, about you to, to tell you what you should do in this particular case. I would suggest either retaking the test and raising that quant score or you know, evaluating whether you have enough other evidence of quantability. And again, it also depends on where you're applying. You're very welcome for the session. Thanks for the feedback. Madavi asked, do schools like Stanford, Harvard, MIT, et cetera, have any cutoffs for GPA? To my knowledge, they have no formal cutoffs GPA for GPA. However, <laughs> um, I would, you know, they, if you apply with a 1.9 GPA, you're not, you're not getting into those programs. Occasionally, we see like a two point something uh, it was admitted, but it's pretty unusual. And that person had to have uh, a really high test score some fantastic context probably, or perhaps a graduate uh, degree in addition to undergraduate. I mean, don't, don't be naive about that. Okay, Mitt asked, to what extent does a GMAT of 760 mitigate low stats from a no-name undergraduate school for an Indian male engineer? It definitely helps. I mean, that, that's an excellent GMAT score. I can't give you a percentage basis. And again, they're gonna look at, at the whole package, but... Um, did you have good grades at, as an undergrad? I realize it was a no-name no, no school, but were your grades good there? Mitt, if you're here still. Yeah, All right. if you get into the chat, chat window, just answer that question, that'll help too. If your grades were good, and you've got this ex excellent GMAT score, congratulations, then the GMAT score will, I think, go really far. Um, if your grades there were mediocre, mm, it might it still help tremendously, um, but 
they're going to wonder why you didn't perform at a no-name school. Will it be wise to, an honest attendee asks, will it be wise to apply with nine to 10 years of work experience? Well, <laughs> that depends. <laughs> That depends on what you did in that work experience, what your goals are, what schools you're applying to, um, uh, how you did academically. Uh, again, what, what you know, uh, all those kinds of things. Carly, can you post the, the article for older MBA applicants? I think that might help this, this attendee, okay? There are also some programs that are aimed at people with 10 years of experience, specifically Stanford MSX, MIT Sloan Fellows, and London Business School Sloan Fellows. Um, but again, you can't look at this, these, this kind of a stat in a vacuum, okay? If I'm on a low budget, is purchasing the service worth it? I might get accepted, but I won't have the budget though. I'm not sure I understand the question. If, if you have the money to, to, let's say, apply to four schools where the application fee is, let's say, they can be $250 a, a pop, but let's just say it's $200 a pop. Okay, so it's $800 in application fees and our one hour service is $340 and that could help you apply successfully just in terms of directing to the appropriate school or giving you advice on how to mitigate weaknesses. So I'm not, I'm not, you know, it seems to me like it would be a, a good investment. Um, but if you don't have the money to apply, I mean, you also have to pay tuition and, you know, all that stuff. So I'm a little, a little confused by the question. Um, okay, let's. Anastasia asks, how important are the letters of recommendation referenced? You know, it's, it's very hard for me to put a percentage on, on the, um, their importance. There's no question that admissions committee members read those letters and they're looking for strong letters of recommendation from people who know you well and are enthusiastic about your candidacy. So when you're applying to highly competitive programs, really everything is important. Uh, I once was participating in a, a, an online forum and the either then director of admissions or former director of admissions at Wharton was responding to a question. This was several years ago, but it always is stuck with me. What's, what's the most important part of your application? And he said, the weakest part, because that's the part that can keep you out. So, you know, I wouldn't uh, overlook letters of recommendation, get the best ones you can. We do have on the site also articles on asking for recommendations and what they should be, what should be in them. Um, Gabrielle asks, naming time management in undergrad is a factor in a low GPA. Um, bad if you can demonstrate improvement in that area. Now, I think I answered that before, but the succinct answer is no. If you can demonstrate, if you take responsibility for some poor choices earlier in your undergraduate career and show that you improved, um, that is going to uh, actually help you. Seven point six out of ten MIT is, is not a bad GPA on the Indian scale. Manavi asks, my low GPA is consistent over three years of undergrad because of being very active in social entrepreneurship, where I helped underprivileged women set up a business which is still helping them earn a steady income. Will this reason be taken positively? It definitely will be taken positively, but you're still going to need to show them that you know how to apply yourself academically. Let's see. Um, Okay, this is from an anonymous attendee. My GRE score is 330. 
my GPA is a 7.46 on a scale of 10. I graduated in the first, I have graduated six years back from one of the top IITs and was very heavily involved in student leadership activities. I completed all three levels of the CFA program in the shortest possible duration of 18 months. Do you think I would still have to explain my GPA if I applied to Stanford and HBS? No, I don't view a 7.46 from IIT as a low um, GPA. It's not a high one, but it's not a low one for those programs. No. All right, let's see. Anonymous and attendee asks, what if my GPA in my first year is bad, but the overall GPA after four years of study is good? And does a master's degree help? Well, again, it, it depends a little bit on how bad and how much it improved, but in general, an upward trend in grades is definitely a mitigating factor and helps a lot. Does a master's degree help? Assuming you got good grades in the master's degree, yeah, it'll help somewhat, for sure. All right. And this is from Sudar Deep. I'm going to be 29 in July and have been unable to apply due to personal circumstances. Caring for elderly parents during COVID and can't leave job and pursue MBA at the moment due to financial difficulties. As such, I'm wondering about my age when I apply. I will hopefully be applying for round one, 2022. Any advice, please? Um, if you apply as a, a 30 year old, if you apply as a 30 year old, you really don't have to to worry about it. Um, you're a little bit above average. I would suggest that you apply to programs that are that have higher average ages at matriculation. But um, and, I, and Carly just posted the article for older MBA applicants. And what you what I would suggest you do though is don't just make excuses in for why you didn't apply earlier say why then or now at that point in time is the right time for you to apply. Also, on the job, seek opportunities to show initiative, responsibility, assumption of responsibility, and, uh, and growth on the job, leadership in, in a nutshell, because that's what the schools are going to be looking for. They're going to want to see that progress. They're going to want to see growth and um, go with that. Do the best you can. But I don't, I don't, you don't have to feel that you're automatically disadvantaged because you didn't apply at 28 or 29. Amala asks, thanks for hosting. I'm a consultant with three years of work experience applying for round one, ideally HSW with a 320-ish GRE. Graduated from Northwestern undergrad with a 3.8 GPA. Is my GRE not going to get my foot in the door? Um, I don't think your GRE is, is I think your GRE is a, is a hurdle to overcome. And given that you have time, unless you've already tried to raise it, I would encourage you to retake it so that you don't have that hurdle to overcome. You're coming from a background that um, you know, is very competitive as a consultant. Um, your 3.8 is great from Northwestern, that's fantastic. But unless you have truly exceptional work experience and uh, you know initiative, et cetera, I would encourage you to retake that score. Um, yeah, if, you're, if your retake is, in, is if your G, GRE doesn't improve, should you try MBA math? Sure. Sure. All right, I think we've gone over, we're just about to go over. You're very welcome. Um, I wanna thank you for your time, your questions, your answers, and your attention. I want to share one last thought and story before we close. And I would like to ask you a question. Your low stats are part of your past. The MBA is a bridge to your future, as we discussed at the very beginning. You don't have to let your past define you or dictate that future. Determine if your stats are low, if yes, try to change them. If you can't or don't want to, consider other schools that will help you achieve your goals. But in all cases, wherever you apply, make that positive case for acceptance. 
We worked recently with a client who was applying to elite schools despite a GMAT that was more than 60 points below his target school's average. Here's what this international applicant wrote after getting accepted to his top three choices despite that low test score. My consultants, my accepted consultants on parallel support paid dividends. I never thought of getting accepted in all three of my top choices. She did an amazing job at meeting the deadlines and more importantly, truly dedicating her time, adding valuable comments to improve my essays and make me stand out among the applicants. Working with her was truly a pleasure. Although my situation is kind of difficult, I'm sure all of you would love these kinds of difficulties in a good way. Since he had to choose between Harvard, Stanford and Wharton, I decided that HBS would be my top choice. I can finally say I got accepted. Do what this client and so many others like him and like you did, get acceptance help and access the kind of guidance and mentoring that enabled his acceptance and motivated him to write this happy email. There is no need to flounder and wonder how to make the most of your strengths and how to mitigate your weaknesses. This fellow is on the path to his dream career despite a low test score. Join him on that path get accepted. Now, you've attended, now for the question, what do, what, do I, what do I have to ask for you? You've attended the webinar, you've heard my pitch, you've listened through the Q&A, you're clearly interested in what I have to say. Can you help me with the following question? Would you be willing to share why you are sitting on the fence or hesitating to purchase an hour of consulting, let's say, or accepted services on a, on a larger scale? And then you can do that in chat window or, or question window at this point. Both are open. What's causing you to hesitate? Anybody want to share? Pandemic has wrecked havoc on my savings. Yeah, that's, I know a lot of people are, are having a tough time financially. We do have some payment options on the site. Um, we do have some payment options on the site, both through PayPal and through Affirm, but they are for people with US social security numbers. I think both of them. Um, but again, I wanna encourage you to consider at least a strategy session. That's, you know, one hour, it's $340. It's less than the cost of two application fees for most schools. So if that one hour helps you to produce better applications across the board or apply to more relevant schools, it could be money that earns you an incredible return on investment. And Amala says, cost, my peers have done it themselves and have been successful, but maybe I don't know about the unsuccessful stories. Well, they're probably not sharing those with you. That's true. That's true. And I'm not saying um, you also don't know if they could have gotten into perhaps a better school for them. Um, they're, they're happy where they're going, and that's great. Some anonymous attendee also says budget concerns. Realize that the, I mean, money is, is a real factor. I understand that. I'm not, I'm not belittling it. And as uh, Bharat said, the pandemic has made things much harder. And I think uh, Suhardeep also mentioned the impact of the pandemic on, on his life. Um, we, every year, every single year, we have applicants come to us and they attend webinars. Some of them may be even take advantage of our free consultations because they're considering uh, buying our services. And then they don't buy the services and then they come back a year later. So they missed out on a year of MBA earnings, which is usually substantial higher than what you're making now. They have to pay for reapplication and they still pay us. They would have been much better coming to us earlier. So just something to keep in mind. Um, can you get in? Yes. Are you getting into the best school for you? Maybe, maybe not. And there's not probably not sharing stories of, uh, of the rejection. So when you think of the budget concerns, also think of the potential 
for loss because you're not spending this money. Make sure you're not being uh, penny wise and pound foolish is what I'm trying to say. And that's a, I don't know, that's an English expression. I'm not sure if that comes through. Is that clear? The penny wise and pound foolish is that, uh, I see many Indian names on the participant list. So, all right, budget concerns are real. I sympathize. Um, but again, at least the hourly services are very, very flexible that accepted offers. And the other thing I want to mention is if you, we do have a one hour minimum, but beyond that one hour minimum, if you buy time and you don't use it all up, you can get a, a refund of unused time. So you're not locked in um, and you're, it's not like you're, you've spent the money and it's gone. You can still manage the process and save perhaps some money that way. Okay, if the more time you buy, the less per hour cost is. But um, anyways, anybody else want to comment on why they're hesitating to engage with Accepted? If not, I will thank you for your time, your answers, your questions, your attention. I've very much enjoyed this masterclass and I hope you found it very beneficial. Good luck with your applications. Take care. <laughs>